And so she returned home. He looked at the tracker that he had and realized that she um, was probably trying to get some help and was really angry with her. And then the next day, she decided to pack a go bag, you know, just a little bag to be able to get out. And he watched her in her bedroom on his camera, watched her packing that go bag. And that was the moment that he chose to move from the stalking to the violence. And he went in when he saw that she was packing a go bag, and then he proceeded to beat her. The Senate passes a bill that protects victims who live in the same home as their stalker. Good evening. Welcome to Lawmakers on day 25 of the Georgia Legislative Session. I'm Donna Lowry in Atlanta. On the show, we'll talk about a bill that would make pre-K and kindergarten mandatory in Georgia. A couple of the legislators who favor that move are here in the studio to talk about it. The spotlight is also on pre-K when it comes to the sports betting bills, with the money going to the Lottery for Education Fund. Also, there are several health bills introduced in this session. Tonight, we'll talk about raising the tobacco tax, removing a fee for ambulance companies, providing Medicaid coverage for whole genome sequencing, and requiring schools to provide water safety education information to parents. We'll hear from the lawmakers sponsoring those bills and Andy Miller with Kaiser Health News. But first, let's get started at the Gold Dome with Capitol correspondent Rochelle Ritchie. Rochelle? Well, hi, Donna. Things are definitely starting to speed up here at the Capitol as we are nearly one month away from the end of the session. In the House today, multiple bills passing centered around energy, financial disclosure, and unsolved crimes. And Donna, as you mentioned, a very unique bill in the Senate that discusses how to protect those that live with their stalkers. House Bill 88, known as the Coleman Baker Act, passed unanimously and will support law enforcement agencies and families in solving unsolved homicides. One, it would give family members uh, of cold case homicides an opportunity uh, to have the case file reviewed six years after the death of the individual, of their family member. It includes a reporting requirement. Right now, we really don't know how many cold cases there are in Georgia. The GBI has about 500 cold cases. We don't know how many across individual agencies in Athens, Clark County. There's 40 since 1972, but we don't have a statewide number on how many cold cases there are in Georgia. And then finally, this legislation clarifies that unsolved homicides and unsolved homicides that death certificates can be issued with a generic homicide cause of death to ensure that individuals and families can have uh, they're, they're, uh, receive a death certificate for their loved one. Some friendly banter over House Bill 396. This is about the uh, Oconee River, right? Do you know what county I reside in? That you reside in? Yes, sir. No, sir. Oconee County. Do you further yield? Yes, sir. Did you ask me to sign this bill? No, sir. Mm. But the river's not in your county either. The bill passed and will simply add the president of Georgia College and State University to the Oconee River Greenway Authority. Also making its way through the House, House Bill 73 puts more restrictions on solar energy providers to protect homeowners from bad actors. It gives the PSC, Public Service Commission, the ability to have to issue COAs, which are certificates of authority. The PSC already regulates energy and power in our state, and they're already receiving the complaints from bad actors. So I believe this is the right group to regulate this emerging market. Second, it requires a written disclosure to be given to the buyer or lessee. This will include things like calculations used to determine total cost of the system, calculations on the cost savings, and whether or not you're purchasing or leasing the system, as well as who gets maybe gets the tax credits uh, from that system. But not every member was on board. The PSC currently does not provide certificates of authority. It's why sellers should instead register, I think, through the Secretary of State, like similar industries. In addition, there is no funding in this bill for the C PSC to stand up an office that such a task requires. Does this mean that in the future, we could receive a request for funding once it becomes apparent the resources required for such a certification process. 
Despite objections, the bill passed 125 to 44. And lastly, in the House, House Bill 518 regarding administrative assessments for the Department of Labor. In 1987, the, uh, the legislature passed a bill creating an administrative assessment for uh, employers in the state of Georgia. This small amount of wages, percentage of wages, goes towards the administrative costs of the Department of Labor. It's been renewed numerous times over the years. Unfortunately, in 2022, it was not renewed and its sunset. It reverted back to a rate that was before 1987 based on the uh, tables from the Department of Labor. This bill will put it back at the rate that it was last year, which is 2.64%. We want to make sure that if we can be able to have it so that employers of themselves, new employers coming in, that that 2.64%, that we can actually match that up. So that 2.7% is, is ground lease one that employers are paying into, then we know that it's going to be able to help to be able to shore up those resources should we get into a situation where we're having a recession. That bill passed 105 to 64. In the Senate, before the bills were debated, a dispute over the Senate version of the supplemental 2022-23 fiscal year budget. Yesterday, the Senate refused to make changes to their version. Then on to the legislation. Senate Bill 83 now expands stalking laws to include people sharing a home and allows the ability to implement protective orders against the stalker. We have not changed the definition of stalking at all when it comes to the criminal code. We are simply saying that, listen, if this is happening in a person's home, a shared home, then they can go to a judge and receive a temporary restraining order so that they can get help. SB 149, the Georgia Door-to-Door -Door Sales Act, will provide Georgians recourse against aggressive door-to-door -door salesmen. This is tightly written to control certain things that have happened throughout our state where door-to-door -door aggressive salesmen took advantage of our most vulnerable citizens our senior citizens, and those who maybe were not capable of making a decision of that magnitude at the moment. So this simply allows a 30-day, 30-business-day cooling-off period for products or services that achieve two of the following three things. One, it costs $10,000 or more. It includes leasing or financing of 10 years or more, or are eligible for federal tax credits that are presented by a salesperson to be eligible for such credits. What is this really about? This is about some companies that were representing solar solutions to folks throughout our state, and unfortunately sometimes sold people things from fifty to $150,000, ultimately causing them great financial harm and not producing a return on investment. Both bills passed 51 to 3. And Donna, it is also worth mentioning that House Bill 416 also passed. It is on its way to the Senate. Now, this bill would allow for qualified pharmacy techs to administer vaccines to people over the age of 18. Donna, that is my Capitol Report. Back to you. Lots of news. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Georgia's pre-K program turns 30 this year. When it started, it was the nation's first universal preschool program for four-year-olds. Over the years, it's changed a bit. We'll talk about that and more with our guests in the studio, Democratic Representative Greg Kennard of Lawrenceville and Democratic Representative Jasmine Clark of Lilburn. Welcome to Lawmakers, Gwinnett County people. Yes. <laughs> Representative Kennard, you're the lead sponsor on HB 173, and that would um, make not just pre-K, but kindergarten mandatory in the state. Talk about your reasons behind wanting this. Right, well, kindergarten uh, is not required in Georgia, uh, and of course, pre-K is not either. But our pre-K program is so effective. Uh, studies have been done. I have talked to my own principals in my own elementary schools. Uh, the pre-K kids coming through the schools are outperforming the non-pre-K kids far and above. So it's really effective. Right now about 60% of our four-year-olds attend pre-K. I want to jump that up to 100% because there is a literacy problem in Georgia. Uh, we're struggling with reading proficiency and those low literacy rates are have some very significant consequences. Low literacy often leads to poverty, poor health outcomes, uh, dropping out of school, teen pregnancy, and incarceration. And that's borne out in our prison population statistics where most of the folks in our state prisons 
our school dropouts. Okay, so you also agree, you, you're a signer on this bill, that early learning is essential. Yes, absolutely. I think that the data shows that it is always good to have an educated populace. Um, as uh, my colleague Greg said, you know, or Representative Kennard said, you know, when it comes to educating um, our, our children, our students, this is a pathway to, um, to having a, a good life and not one where they're going to end up in our um, carceral system. And as we know, Georgia, unfortunately, leads the world in having people both incarcerated and uh, or under, um, under the uh, criminal justice system in some type of way. And so, you know, if we have a way of curbing that, we should 100 percent be going in that direction because it costs a whole lot less to educate than it costs to incarcerate. I do have to ask about the mandatory part of it. There are, you know, there will be some people who will not want to be forced to put their kids in pre-K or kindergarten. Some people don't even put their kids in school till first grade. Yeah, there may be some exceptions, some carve outs for homeschooling and things like that, but it's we've got to get our kids in the classroom earlier than later, and it's going to make a difference in their family's life, in the individual's life, in our state's life. As uh, Representative Clark said, it costs about $5,400 a year to run one of our four year olds through pre K. It costs us $27,000 a year to incarcerate someone. The average prison sentence is five years, so that's over 125 grand. To incarcerate someone. Yeah. So let's let's talk about something else dealing with pre-K. We know that there are some bills out there dealing with sports betting, and with sports betting, it's under education, and the money would actually go into the lottery for education, which includes pre-K and hope. So let's let's talk about the fact that maybe there are some people. Some people do not think that that's the route to go necessarily, but others are. This might be sports betting may help pre-K. What do you think? So uh, the Higher Education Committee is the committee that is hearing or that has heard and it is passed out of the Higher Education Committee, House Bill 380, which is the sports betting bill. And um, the proponents of the bill say this will be an opportunity for us to put more money into HOPE and pre-K. And while I am very excited for that opportunity, I think we still need bills like House Bill 1, uh, 173 that will still make it universal and mandatory across the board. And the reason why is because uh, right now, the governor just fully funded Hope Scholarship. It's not necessarily that we don't have the money, it's how we're using the money. So if we're gonna bring sports betting to Georgia, if we're gonna bring another 125 million plus uh, dollars into the state, specifically into the coffers for the Georgia Lottery to disseminate into um, either Hope Scholarship or Pre-K. Let's actually open up access to Pre-K to more people. I grew up in DeKalb County. Pre-K was at the elementary school. Where I am in Gwinnett County, that's not necessarily the case at most of the schools. Yeah, and you say there's money already in the Lottery for Education Fund that could be helping with pre-K. We're sitting on about $2 billion of lottery surplus. We're only constitutionally mandated to keep that at $800 million. So there's $1.2 billion just sitting there that could be deployed to today to fund the expansion of pre-K. The physical note says it would take us about $250 million to get all the way there 100%. Okay. I um, will see how that bill goes, but I, I want to get to quickly to a few of your other bills. You have a bill for an age-appropriate course of study in sex education and HIV prevention. Tell us more. So I have been working on this bill since I was first elected in 2018. It is just a bill that will make sure, number one, that um, our sex education that's being taught across the state is number one age-appropriate. It will also update stigmatizing language. Right now in uh, our code, it says that we have to teach about AIDS or AIDS prevention, and that's just not uh, scientifically correct. We need to be teaching about HIV, which is a virus that can lead to AIDS, but with advances in technology does not often or does not always lead to AIDS. So we need to be talking about 
HIV itself. And so this really just updates the language from the way we used to talk in the 1980s when we first learned about HIV and AIDS. Okay, so it's just basically bringing us up to date on some things. Absolutely. All right, so you have a bill though that it would, which would focus on arrest only criminal history records information. Explain right. why, first of all, why you wanted this and what it would do. Okay, so I work with the homeless population in my profession, and so I see these criminal record barriers show up all the time. And uh, at the point of arrest in Georgia, a GCIC record is generated that automatically starts popping up on them. job applications, housing applications, even college applications. Before you've been charged, only arrested, you're already being punished by that record. And so my bill says at the point of arrest, that record is restricted. Um, not to law enforcement, but to the general public, so it's not a barrier to begin with. If you are indicted, charged, the record is unrestricted, you can see it, but at the point of, uh, after due process, if the case led to a non-conviction, not guilty, the, dismissed, then that arrest record would be restricted and sealed at that point. Right now it's not, so you're being punished for a crime that you were potentially acquitted for. So you could be arrested, it stay, stays around, and you're affected by it, but you may, they may the charges may have been dis dismissed. And That's correct, but the never... arrest record is persistent, stubborn, it's lingering, and right now there are 1.82 million residents in Georgia who have an arrest only, non-conviction, no charge record. It's amazing to think that there are that many people out there with this, so it would affect a lot of people. What kind of support are you getting? Uh, it's going through uh, judiciary, non-civil, so there's some pushback uh, on, from prosecutors, uh, the sheriffs, but there is some good support from our advocates and criminal justice reform uh, allies. Okay. So we'll see how it goes. Okay. Anything you wanted to add to that, first of all, with that? Oh, no, I, I think it's a great bill. I think that uh, uh, my colleague, Representative Kennard, always has good ideas when it comes to criminal justice reform in the right way. And I think this one is a no-brainer. I mean, 1.82 million people could be um, affected positively by a bill like this. Okay, so we'll keep a uh, lookout for all of those bills. Crossover day is Monday. We'll see how it goes. I want to thank you both for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Coming up, we'll talk about several bills dealing with health issues. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy. The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. Here's what's new this month with Passport. Kirsten had a lot of courage. She fought for black culture. could have killed you. You're exactly what we need right now. Oh my God. What is this? She was poisoned. These and all your favorite shows are available with Passport. Support your PBS station and stream more with Passport on the PBS app. We care about things that affect the lives of every American. We are there at the front line to get to the heart of what really matters in every issue. This country has not seen this in 80 years. This extraordinary moment in American history. You're making such a huge impact. Trust is at the heart of what we do. One of the easiest ways to support GPB is to become a monthly GPB sustainer. Your monthly support continues automatically month after month and supports not only the great programming that you love on GPB, but also our efforts in the community. GPB is committed to provide a trusted space for lifelong learning on the air, digitally and in person all across Georgia. All this is made possible with your monthly support. And we can't do it without you, so please donate right now at gpb.org slash give. And thanks. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Donna Lowry. We're going to talk about several health bills legislators are 
hoping to get through crossover day on Monday. Joining us is the founder and CEO of Georgia Health News, which is now Kaiser Health News, Andy Miller. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We're gonna, gonna talk about several things. Okay, and as always, the biggest health news during recent sessions is Democrats pushing for full Medicaid expansion. It's not a priority for the governor, but we will see partial Medicaid expansion, and, and that will begin as early as July. It comes with a stipulation. So tell us a little bit about this, because this passed last year or the year before? It passed, and then the federal government struck it down, but a federal judge kind of re-energized it, and, and so it's going to go ahead. Basically, people who are, have no insurance but are below the poverty line will be able to get uh, Medicaid coverage if they meet certain work or education requirements, essentially 80 hours a month. 80 hours a month, and it can be volunteer time, it could be working, yes. or they could be doing school. In that. But then this year, we're going to have something added to that, and it, it's at SB 65. Tell us about that, because this will affect a lot of people. Well, hundreds of thousands of Georgians get their insurance through healthcare.gov, which is the exchange, and that's for individuals, families that don't have employer coverage or don't have uh, government coverage either. So what this will do, instead of going to healthcare.gov, which is run by the feds, right, it will be a Georgia-run system. And so uh, Senate Bill 65 has is, is already passed the Senate and is moving along, and it, the governor has backed it. And I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in Georgia, because it'll start next year, and signups will be in the fall. And we'll have to watch and see how well it's resourced, how many navigators and counselors it has, how, how the state supports it technologically as well as manpower. Yeah, people who've been used to healthcare.gov have to know to switch over with yes, this. Yes, yes. Let's get back to the, the one we talked about, the part that's already going to take effect in July of, um, of this Medicaid expansion. There's some discrepancy on who many, how many people this might affect. Well, if you talk to the Republicans, they'll say, you know, something like 300,000 people. If you talk to people who support Medicaid expansion, they say it'll only be like 45,000, maybe up to 90,000. Mm -hmm. So it's a big, it's a huge difference. But the advocates will say, look, it's not going to help the homeless. It's not going to help full-time caregivers. They're not going to be able to work 80 hours a month. And so we'll just have to see how it plays out. And there'll be a lot of eyes on Georgia because we'll be the only state to do that. We have work requirements for the Medicaid expansion. Okay, I know you'll be keeping up with it. We're also seeing interest in Medicaid covering certain medical needs. So we've seen a few of those things. Uh, for instance, I spoke earlier today to Representative Scott Hilton of Peachtree Corners about his bill to have Medicaid cover whole genome sequencing. And here's sequencing. Here's how he described it. A child is born with a rare disease, they oftentimes spend a couple months in NICU while they try to figure out what exactly is going on. By Medicaid covering now whole genome sequencing, we can quickly diagnose what that rare disease is uh, by really breaking it apart and studying their, their DNA. Uh, it will allow doctors to figure out what treatment is best for that child and ultimately save the state and Medicaid in the long run the quicker we are able to diagnose what's going on uh, with that child. So before we go any further, here's a list of what whole genome sequencing can detect. Intellectual disability and learning problems, developmental issues, including delays in walking or talking for a child, brain abnormalities, seizures, hearing and vision problems, heart and lung problems, intestinal problems, skeletal and limb abnorm abnormalities, immune deficiencies for recurrent infections and recurrent or severe unexplained illnesses, quite a list of things. And I guess if you have the money, your health care covers it, you're, you can take care of it. What I guess Representative Hilton would like to see is Medicaid take care of that for people who can't afford it. Right, and the earlier you can diagnose and treat a child is obviously a great thing because the, the chances of a good medical outcome are heightened if you can do that. Yeah, it, but it, whether or not we see this bill, he's pretty hopeful on it. But um, I think it's a whole area that people are going to have to learn more about and recognize 
that this sequencing can take place? Well, it's science marching on and, and us trying to keep up with the science and bring good outcomes to patients. Okay, let's move on to a bill we've seen before, and that's to increase the tobacco tax in Georgia. I spoke earlier today to Republican Representative Ron Stevens about his tobacco bill. Every year, Georgia spends uh, $700 million at least on Medicaid for tobacco-related illnesses. Uh, we've put this bill in several times, and it's one that would bring some revenue back to the state to pay for these tobacco-related illnesses. It connects the dots. All that this bill would have done would have done the very minimum to raise the tobacco tax 20 cents, which would tie us for South Carolina for 49th in the country. We're that far down. And so all this would have done is to generate some drawdown federal dollars to pay for the, the uh, medical services that somebody's going to get sick with, uh, with tobacco products. Yeah, tobacco products, pretty cheap in Georgia, the cheapest anywhere, and even 20 cents would just raise us up to South Carolina and number 46 on that. Yeah, we have the second lowest cigarette tax, uh, is 37 cents a pack, and, you know, the health advocates and the medical professionals will say if we can prevent kids and youth from starting to smoke with a higher tobacco tax it makes a lot of sense health wise but also revenue wise i mean we'll get the more state dollars in and we will save on the back end and if they become habitual smokers and they get a you know cancer or something else we'll have to treat them yeah. uh, so Anything that we can do to raise this tax, I think, makes a lot of sense. And every year this comes up, so it we'll does. see where it goes this year. So Representative Hilton also wants to remove uh, a fee that is com currently involved with ambulance companies. Here's what he had to say. For the last 20 years, our ambulance services here in Georgia, all kind of small businesses, have had to pay $2,500 per company and $1,000 per ambulance to receive what's called a provider fee, uh, where they'd get higher reimbursement rates on their Medicaid. Well, we as the state have not been living up to that bargain, and so uh, what the bill proposes is doing away with that fee, returning that money back to the small business uh, to allow them to serve patients better. As we know right now, there's a workforce shortage uh, in that space, and so the more money they've got in their pockets, they can hire folks who will then, again, take care of our, our patients here in Georgia. And of course, they have the, the workforce shortage everybody else is dealing with, but also this is kind of a, uh, interesting because of where the money goes. It goes to the state general fun and, and and if you talk to ambulance companies they would like to see it back in the EMS system where it's needed and so the repeal bill makes makes sense from that standpoint because they don't want it to go to the general fund they want it in health care if yeah. they're going to pay it they want it in health care and the, the thing about it people seem to be using ambulances more than ever so it's it's very true and there are areas that are not as well served as they could be particularly in rural areas of okay. our state Let's talk to, I talked to Hilton about something else. He has a bill that will be on the House tomorrow and it'll be something they'll look at and it deals with swimming. The number one cause of death uh, for children of young ages is uh, accidental drowning. And so uh, what we've done is drafted a bill where schools now on an annual basis have to send either electronically or hard copy information on free or reduced swimming lessons in your community. And, and the goal is to save lives here in Georgia, create a safer, healthier Georgia uh, by making sure parents have the resources to figure out where to educate their kids on how to get swimming lessons. And by the way, that bill, become, if it becomes law, we've called the Edna May McGovern Act, named for a nine-year-old who died in a drowning incident. So this one looks pretty good for the House floor tomorrow. It's, it's a good prevention bill, and if we can save one or two lives a year, or however many, this is such a tragedy for families and their communities okay. when a drowning happens. Yeah, so not a lot of time left, but I want you briefly to talk about the mental health bill. It's moving along as of today. This is, this is mental health reform part two. Last year's bill was huge. This one does some added things that should help. It will help build up our workforce, mental health professional workforce. It will consolidate data. It will build up also our capacity of facilities to help these people. And, and it will focus on people who are called familiar faces. And these are people that cycle between homelessness and jails and facilities. And it will address some of their needs, hopefully. 
Okay, we'll hear more about it. And of course, uh, Speaker Burns is favoring this, so yes. we'll see how it goes. Thanks so much for coming on. Lots always going on with health care. Great to be with you, Donna. All right, thanks Thank so you. much. And that does it for Lawmakers Today. We'll be back tomorrow for day 26 of the Georgia Legislative Session. Keep up with po politics with Political Rewind with Bill Nygut. Weekdates at 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Good night.